computer. That still freaks me out. <laughs> Recording in progress. Let's go live on the book of the face. <clears throat> Description. Blah, 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 blah. Page. Section Council. Legislation. It's going live. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Welcome to the VAC roundtable number 17. We are discussing upcoming legislation or actual legislation that's in house right now or in Senate, I might add. Uh, joining us tonight are, of course, uh, regulars Ricardo Prieta, Tony Landry, Michael Krawitz, and uh, George Armstrong. We're all council members with the Veterans Action Council. And, um, of course, we'll be starting off talking tonight. Oh, we have another guest joining us. Pearson Crosby is going to be joining us as well. Uh, we're talking about upcoming legislation. So what's being introduced what would we introduce and what do we feel is most likely to get through? Also banking. Yes, banking. Banking was the first one to actually make it uh, through uh, voting, but <clears throat> uh, Shifty Shift has decided that uh, banking should be put on hold for now and has decided to focus more on the MORE Act. So of course, that's uh, these are what's happening. Of course, we have these safe Harbor Act in the Senate, the Common Sense Cannabis Reform for Veterans, Small Businesses, and Medical Professionals Act, and the Fully Informed Veterans Act <clears throat> in the House. So that's what we're at currently. Um, so for our first discussion will be about what's being introduced. Um, and of course, we've seen what's out there. So uh, <clears throat> seeing what's out there, let's uh, comment on that before uh, we discuss on what we would introduce. So as we go around the discussion, uh, I am Etienne Fontan. I will be your uh, guide this evening and we will go around uh, to individual speakers and we'll start off with uh, Ricardo Prieta, council member. Hello. Um, yep, Ricardo Prieta, I'm from Tucson, Arizona, army veteran. And um, I, as far as the legislation that's circling right now, I've been really paying attention to the Safe Harbor Act and the common sense bill that Joyce put out. So the Safe Harbor Act in the Senate from Schatz in Hawaii, also reintroduced by Senator Tim Kaine uh, out of Virginia from the Senate Armed Services Committee. And then uh, David Joyce in the House with that common sense bill um, out of Ohio um, I'm hoping Mr. Kowalski can jump on here soon and talk to us about it, but um, it's promising that there's so much conversation going around this issue now, but uh, bills have been passed or put forward before, voted on in a bipartisan fashion, only to be stripped out at the last sentence or minute before it gets sent up to uh, the president for him to sign. But we'll see. Um, there's a lot of us at the table trying to advocate for our position to get what it is that our community requires. Uh, what comes out of that sausage making process, I guess is anybody's guess. All right, thank you very much, Council Member Prieta. We'll go over to Council Member Krowitz. Uh, Michael, what do you make of things that are happening right now? You know, uh, as I was uh, thinking about this, um, it, it strikes me it, it might be helpful to go backwards a little bit before we go forwards. Um, the uh, most of the bills that we have that are veteran specific bills are trying to fix a specific problem, a problem that we brought to the attention of the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs and Congress uh, many years ago, the problem around the 
Veterans uh, Health uh, uh, Department or the, uh, what is it, VHA, Veteran, Veterans Health Administration doctors, uh, uh, inability to recommend or to fill out the forms for veterans to participate in state medical marijuana programs. And of course, <laughs> a tiny bit of history there, uh, the reason why the VA has that uh, uh, policy is back when the uh, medical cannabis really was just, you know, the modern medical cannabis was just starting. Proposition 215 had just passed in, in 1996 in California. And uh, for those that were following it back then, remember that the United States government reacted quite aggressively against medical marijuana at first. The drug czar of the United States at the time, uh, uh, the, the drug czar McCaffrey, the head of the Office of National Drug Control Policy went out and uh, made comments and statements that this was Cheech and Chong medicine. He went after our lead doctor, Dr. Micaria, and made statements that they were going to round up and arrest all these doctors that were recommending cannabis under state laws. Uh, Dr. Conan, uh, together with the ACLU, proactively sued the government and won in the Ninth Circuit. The court case was never picked up by the Supreme Court, so it never became the law of the land. However, the arguments that they made in the Ninth Circuit out there in California were very portable and that they were basic free speech arguments. They stipulated that, you know, you couldn't write a prescription because the prescription pad was controlled by the DEA, but that writing a recommendation was an act of free speech and that indeed you needed that level of free speech for the doctor patient relationship. Based on that, we brought to the attention of the American people, you know, starting around 2007, 2008, um, this fact, you know, that the VA was not allowed to write these recommendations and that their lack of free speech, according to that Conan argument, was actually interfering with the doctor-patient relationship. And that has led to a whole bunch of bills in Congress. But the, the last thing I want to say before we move on is just that a lot of these bills are fixing a problem that's immediate, but not permanent. So once we get descheduling, once we get federal legislation that regulates cannabis, uh, most, if not all, these issues go away. But uh, things like the Safe Harbor Act, uh, the uh, Veterans Equal Access Act, et cetera, are designed as a stopgap measure to get us through this time period, allow you to have your cannabis on VA property, even though it's federal, allow you to have a doctor at the VA write your recommendation for your state program, even though they lack free speech. And, and the DEA has never you know, retracted. They, they retracted their attack on the doctors out in California, but they never retracted their attack on the doctors inside the system. So as far as I know, they, they're still under the you know, illusion, I would say, that the DEA would come after them and arrest doctors in the VA should they recommend cannabis, which I really think would be an illusion. But anyway, that's, I think, the lay of the land, kind of the, the starting point, and I just wanted to start there. Thank you, member, council member. Um, <clears throat> that's a great assessment and breakdown of history. Uh, next, we will go with uh, Council Member Tony Landry. <clears throat> Hi again, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here as always. My name's Tony Landry. I'm from Louisiana, living in Arizona as a medical cannabis refugee, and I'm uh, proud to be on the VAC Council, working on you know on some issues to try and get veterans access to cannabis on a national level, and. Um, you know, the, like the Safe Harbor Act, like Michael was saying, you know, the, this is great. You know, we can allow doctors to recommend cannabis, but uh, I th what we really need to see is Congress to, m to move on making sure that the uh, Controlled Substance Act is adjusted to follow the, the treaty. You know, once that's done and the VA, you know, this recommendation bull will be over with and they're going to make sure that they're paying for our cannabis and, and um, the doctor's writing a prescription for it. So, you know, it, yeah, it's great seeing these these movements, you know, these steps. It's It's got to be done somehow, some way, and it's just small movements toward it. But um, more and more with the, uh, the DEA changing and allowing um, more research to be done, I see these walls will be falling pretty quick that, the VA is not going to be able to use their old standard argument that it's federally illegal, so they can't do anything about it. And uh, so I'm, I'm just I'm happy to be to support this legislation and hopefully I'll get through this year. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Member. Going over to Council Member George Armstrong. 
Yeah, so I would uh, speak to something that both Mike and Tony talked about in the Safe Harbor Act. Um, if you look at if you look at that, that's going to you know allow veterans to transport and for the the doctors to recommend it. Um, but that kind of what Tony was talking about that is uh, that's one of the laws. And even if they do pass it, it's only a five year law. So that's one of the laws that uh, that really would help would not help the the veterans. Um, in in states that don't allow medical cannabis in a lot of ways i just think a lot of these laws are probably going to get come short of what we want um but it's important to realize that a few years ago we couldn't really get any cannabis laws onto the floor now we broke through so we have several um and i'm not very well read up on on all of them i'm hoping tonight that some of the council members will give us a breakdown of of you know what's uh, what are the positives and negatives of these things and who we need to be contacting um, to, besides the work we're doing who we need to be encouraging people to contact um, to push certain bills to get them through. Thank you very much, Council Member Armstrong. <clears throat> Going over to Council Member Pearson Kennedy Crosby. Thanks, Jim. Um, glad to be here. I'm glad to see everybody here. Um, I think, um, <clears throat> as with uh, all the bills that, that are in circulation right now that pertain to medical um, legislation, um, we I, I feel as if we are. Well, I know this is this, what, what what we're doing or what we're we we've allowed for. Um, uh, myself included, is uh, career politicians, lawyers, and special interest groups to uh, uh, tell our medical professionals how they can best serve us with no background whatsoever. Uh, at least uh, majority of politicians don't have a medical background or any any reason to uh, say that they are a medical professional. I, I think that's the first problem is there's a bunch of people voting on, on rules for medical, um, the, the rules that, that affect us and our health that aren't professionals in uh, healthcare or, um, or uh, medicine. So at the end of the day, I, I think until we solve that problem, we're, we're never going to be able to be satisfied with what is going on in the uh, legislation. Um, that's really that's really all I have to say for opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member. <clears throat> we appreciate it. Uh, and we'll lastly go to Council Member Brian Buckley. Good evening, everyone. So very interesting topic. It eludes me at times, I guess, when you say like, um, you see some things that appear to be very common sense and sometimes they just go by the wayside. And, you know, I, I remember years back where you thought like an omnibus bill was gonna go through that looked like it was gonna be a win for both Democrats and Republicans that had a lot of things in terms of the uh, Safe Harbor Act, Banking Act, VA research, all that stuff. And then it just kind of gets kicked to the curb, <clears throat> not to be here for for a while. And then you hear a lot of politicians saying a lot of right things while they're stumping for the spot that they want to get. But as soon as they get that chair, things seem to kind of go by the wayside. And we just got to call it out what it is. I mean, ASA just put it out there first 100 days. And Joe Biden sounded like a totally different person when he was candidate Biden than he does as President Biden, along with his vice president, who I think really needs to be held accountable and asked, like, what is your guy's plan here? But again, that's what I love about America. Uh, you know, we are the government. We need to remember that we can control our destiny. And that's why I think groups like us, you know, we can sit here all day and hope and wish a bill gets through and who knows what goes on. And you talk to people who've been on Capitol Hill and they say, once you see the sausage being made, it's pretty disturbing. Well, we can control things here and prove it with facts, right? I mean, what are we doing? We're doing some research. We're actually going to work with people that, you know, our government should be doing, but they're not. And that's fine. 
again, we're Americans. We have that ability to kind of direct our own path. So I'm not going to sit here and I, I'm pretty sure a lot of my counterparts here on this council, we're not going to sit around and wait for the government to get their act straight. We'll just take care of ourselves and prove it with overwhelming evidence and uh, change the medical landscape here for our veterans. That's all I got. And that's a key component, you know, by uh, using actual research to dispel these myths. And that's what we've been waiting for. So we appreciate the uh, headaches and what you've gone through to get there. So that's current legislation. <clears throat> so then uh, we have, of course, you know, our own sort of wish list. Uh, we've seen various, uh, you know, bills come out of committee over the years, specifically veteran-wise, only to be killed in the 11th hour by uh, Republicans, flat out, every single time. So uh, they talk a good game, but unfortunately, you know, we are not reaching the right people uh, to affect the change that we want to see it. So that's why, you know, BAC is here. We're trying to figure out our ways and how to plug in and add our voices to uh, the cacophony so that one, we can be heard. So we're past the initial part of our discussion, of course. So, so what's next? What would we like to see? Um, and of course, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a wishless gambit if we wanted to, but we have to be very realistic. So we have come up with some ideas ourselves that we think would be beneficial and effective to start past the conversation of allowing for research. Of course, research is just starting here in California. Uh, we've had uh, actual money put aside specifically for research, but of course, this has just started, which means this is going to be a while before that research is out and peer reviewed, et cetera. It takes time to do things properly. So. Um, we are in the midst of going to be in the waiting game for that. So we have a wish list of what we would like to see moving forward, uh, especially throughout the VHA system. So uh, we'll go around again, a kind of a round robin. We'll continue. We'll go back to Council Member Prieta uh, for your thoughts on uh, what we would like to see. Well, for me, any anything temporary is a non-starter. Uh, the disabilities we suffer from, the injuries that we, we carry, those aren't temporary. Um, it's, it's an everyday kind of thing for us. And to put anything as temporary in any legislation getting put forward is it's just starting out as a slap in the face. It shows a disconnect between what it is that we're living in reality here on the ground and what it is that they're projecting up there from the tower. So that's my first initial uh, thought on that um, when it comes to who we are we're federal patients we've received care those of us enrolled through the veterans health administration um, with a rating and stuff like that, that we receive our benefits is our medical treatment and the, the medical um, treatment that we're not getting right now is a hot topic that cannabis issue and since 2010, 2011, with that uh, VA 2011-004, VA doctors have had the ability, if they want to, to engage in conversation with their patients about what it is that they're using that's helping them to wean off of these harmful pharmaceutical narcotics, the, the, this alcohol addiction that far too many of us uh, suffer from. Uh, They've had that opportunity. How many of them have been doing it? The VA is supposed to have been tracking those numbers. It's already, that information is supposed to go into our medical files already. And that's been over a decade. So whenever we see, I see these key red you know, flag kind of proposals come up that were being made in 2013, 14, 15, and getting cut out, and now, you know, when everything is moving, we have the MORE Act, uh, social equity is being pushed hard, rightfully so. We are a minority group. Veterans have been at the, at the forefront battling prohibition since the beginning. And we require our needs to be met. And that starts off, again, for me, is being recognized as federal patients. Just like Mr. Randall 
just like you know, LV was recognized as a federal patient, we legit receive our care through a federal entity, which is the VA. That's that's my initial blast. Well, thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, we'll go on over to Council Member uh, Michael Krowitz. Thanks, man. Um, to to uh, give you a little bit of inspiration, maybe a little positive, uh, positive positivity in, in answering what Brian was saying. Um, you know, as the old guy, I can say this. Uh, it, it's uh, irritating and disconcerting when a politician makes a bunch of statements and then goes right into office and then seemingly doesn't do anything. So I'm not in any way uh, talking to that. But it wasn't that many years ago where the only positive statements we ever got out of any politicians were quite literally on the day after they left office. <laughs> so, you know, the, uh, the day before they entered office and the day after they leave office is a huge swing. And I think it leaves us a world of possibilities. So uh, I, I hope that's optimistic enough. It's a uh, my. In fact, while I'm saying that, I'll add one more. Back in the day, the only people I would ever answer on the end of any serious journalistic publication would be the drug warriors or the police or the DEA. And then one day, I pulled up this really great, you know, a piece, a journalistic piece about cannabis, and the last word was a cannabis patient. And that was another sort of, you know, very subtle thing that represents a huge change in, in the way that the world is looking at these things. And ever since, I've never seen it. It's never turned back. It's not like they go to Kevin Savet and say, you know, we're going to end this thing. I need your quote. No, it doesn't work that way anymore. So on that note, uh, I got a couple of things I was going to say. One, um, about the data, you know, um, at this point, I mean, I, I would have always been hesitant to try to, we, we had a bill in, in fact, uh, to, to call on the VA to do research and stuff like that, and, and, you know, demanding that they do certain things uh, internally. Uh, that was, you know, after great hesitancy that we started going there. We would like the VA to have done things spontaneously on their own, but as Ricardo was saying, come on, a decade? You've had this for a decade, and it's not like it's been a, a, a minor, hidden, obscure issue. We have close to 90 something percent support in the public and the vast majority of states have modern medical cannabis laws. Uh, the VA is literally hiding in a cave if they don't know that this is a thing. So, you know, I think at this point it is quite appropriate in a bill to demand that the VA talk about what they know and, and how many vets are using it, where they live, what their conditions are, all can be easily correlated from that checkbox that R Ricardo was talking about. So that's number one. And then, unfortunately, the temporary stuff is going to have to continue for a while. Uh, the best I can tell what's going to happen is the federal government's going to have a you know, national policy that will be set in place. But for a lot of things, it's going to defer back to the states, at least at first. I mean, that's my guess. It's hard, like you know, Ricardo was saying, it's going to be hard to you know, really know, and nobody has the crystal ball and know exactly what's going to come out of this process. The leadership in the Senate have said that they're going to try to combine the best elements of all the bills. That's pretty open. Um, and, and it's a big consultative process where really I don't think it's even started because you have to have a draft bill before you can even start that back and forth uh, that we would want to get into and be part of. So anyway, um, that's kind of where we're at, where we'll probably be leaning on medical cannabis programs in the states for quite a while before there are suitable cannabis products and pharmacy shelves that could be sold throughout the VA system in the pharmacy or before the VA, uh, you know, participates in wide scale enough programs of, of research that would enable us to, to allow access for vets across the states, something like that will break. But until then, I think we are going to have to rely on, on the states. And, and then even then, uh, one step further, so you can be thinking about it is, you know, we, I don't, and this big we here, the cannabis movement hasn't really thought through how we're going to handle medical cannabis. Um, in the future, you know, regulated adult, regulated access is, is you know, sort of the, the mainstream um, conversation. And medical access often gets uh, 
sort of uh, assumptive status. I mean, this is something that it goes all the way from the state level all the way to the international level that people just sort of assume that medical cannabis will take care of itself. And for example, in Washington, D.C., we were having a meeting of uh, DCMJ the other day, and many members brought up the inconsistencies of the lack of regulation of the medical program leading to inconsistent medical products for the patients and, and the lack of knowledge and lack of access. So these things are issues that uh, are sort of two layers deep in the conversation nationally, but we absolutely have to have this conversation about the future of medical cannabis under a fully legal program without it being, you know, aside from the pharmacy. I think everybody can imagine the pharmacy, you know, you go to a pharmacy with prescription, you get your product, but all other products, the, what we call traditional and complementary medicine, the products that we've been using that have been based on a thousand years of human experience, those products don't fit in that box that well. And that's the challenge for us as we move forward. And a challenge it is, and a challenge it shall be. Uh, going over to council member, Tony Landry. Yeah, so look, moving forward, I would love to see uh, a lot of veterans got out of the military with, uh, you know, some PTSD or trauma and didn't get the help from the VA because they didn't qualify for help. And uh, for whatever reason, maybe they, they were arrested for, you know, alcohol or drugs. And so I, I would like for the VA to, to, to make good on those benefits that they lost. If they, if they were needing health care and the VA wasn't taking care of it and got denied, and then they ended up maybe uh, having cannabis, getting trying to get cannabis on their own and got arrested, you know, uh, and lost benefits, then, you know, I think the only right thing going forward is, is to, to bring that whole again, bring them whole, bring, you know, make them a whole veteran again, because it, uh, they may have been doing it, the cannabis for medicinal reasons, you know, I mean, um, I think moving forward, it just, uh, like a, on a positive note, like Michael was saying is, uh, you know, just get engaged in, in the political process. There's all sorts of ways, emails, phone calls, and, and just keep a positive note. And it's hard to do to not be confrontational. But the, the first time you get confrontational with these legislators, they're gonna turn you off and then they're, they're not gonna to wanna to hear from you again. So it's, it's very important to, to find your center and say, okay, I'm doing this as a greater good for the greater society. I'm not gonna let my emotions come into play. I'm gonna go into it uh, non, non-confrontational, non-emotional and just state you know, what, how, whatever law is you're trying to change, you know, how it's affecting you. You, you want to change a certain law. This is how it's affecting you. And if you change it, it'll make this better. And you can take any issue and go after it and, and uh, make a difference. You know, uh, just emailing, emailing your, your legislator, your leader, elected official, police chief, action with lower, lower priority of arrest or, or something. If your state does not have a medical cannabis program, then maybe you can lower priority of arrest and that might help somebody out, you know. So just uh, stay involved and stay active. All these things are changing, and but they require engagement. They, they require you to be engaged in the process, okay? So just uh, stay on a positive note and get engaged. Yes, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, which means we have to constantly stay plugged in about what's going on. You know, everybody thinks that the politics doesn't involve them, but it involves every aspect of our lives. So going over to council member George Armstrong. Okay, so um, what I would like to see, I would start, uh, oh, sorry, Amish buggy going around. Um, I would start by, I would, I would put it into a few different places. I think, I think, uh, Michael Krawitz is definitely right. I think the way it's leaning is that the federal government will make some kind of policy um, and then push the majority of everything to the individual states. Um, so we'll have an, we'll we have the potential for a lot of dry counties, even dry states um, after federal legalization. So 
that's exactly first of all that's exactly what i don't want um if i would like to see the federal government um do two things i would like to see them not do that so i don't i when they when they make it legal and i think most of us would would really prefer this even though it may not be the way it's going um when they make it legal um, that they take the option out of the states, at least from arresting people for, for growing medicine, if they have any condition or something of that sort. Um, and then I would like them to do, do something on the federal. important for us to be um, making sure that the uh, making sure that the um, the medical programs and the medical patients are represented at least as good as they are now and obviously what we want to see is some type of federal program where medical patients and veterans who live in states where they don't have medical programs are uh, have access to this life-changing medicine um, without being persecuted for it. And then on the veteran side, I really would like to see um, the people that have a VHA rating and are getting their health care through the federal government, um, just like Rico has said, and in, in kind of we've been pushing the position, I would like to see them become some type of federal, something written into the law where they're, they're a federal patient um, or something of the sort, where regardless of where they are, if they're a if they're under VHA care, Lost your audio. I would I would like to see in kind of like a few different piles, um, and then I think it's it, just like Michael was saying and uh, Tony was getting into. It's really important to understand that it's a long process. We've gotten to where we are, not by hitting a home run, you know, by hitting a, a lot of base hits and sacrifice flies and and doing a lot of work to make tiny steps to move to where we've got now, um, especially the uh, the veterans in the, in the fight that are in the group that have been doing it for decades. Um, so this, you know, it, it seems super slow, but this year, the, the, where we're at now, it's moving lightning fast to where it, to where it has been in the past. So I think it's, it's healthy to remember that as well. And uh, that's where I'll cut off on this round. Uh, speaking of cut off, you unfortunately cut off a couple of times during the conversation, but we were able to get the gist of, <clears throat> of what you were saying. So yeah, no, yeah, you got to stay plugged in constantly. That's, that's the key. Um, all right, Pearson. Well, um, <clears throat> so yes, uh, I, you know, I, I'm always puzzled by how rational the, uh, or how just the, the, the conversation is when, or the, the fight is that you and Michael have been, been fighting for, for, for decades now, like George said, um, and, and really getting very slow, slow progress. Sorry, I'm, um, well, as always, I'm watching my my, my boys. It's um, all good. Carry on. You're doing great. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, the thing the thing that really disturbs me, and, and specifically my my concerning my boys, um, I mean, this is something that like how long did it take to get a COVID COVID vaccine and change laws for for something that that uh, sprung up all of a sudden that. Um, 
you know, didn't didn't take nearly as many lives as the opiate epidemic has in the past 20 years or hasn't um, been uh, the, the legislation pushed it through so quickly. Right. And the 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 common sense of that, which which I believe everyone did what they did in this uh, epidemic using common sense. Uh, uh, to the best of their knowledge, they, they, they tried helping uh, the, the people as much as they possibly could um, in, the, in the best way they, they knew how in their best interests. Um, but with, with how long cannabis has been around and the, the opportunity to, um, to, to, to save lives in so many different ways to, to to um, that that can be justified and can be measured. Yeah, we weren't able to study it formally, but we weren't able to study the the, the vaccines that 300 million Americans have put in their arms uh, in, in in the right time. Where we know that cannabis isn't going to kill you, like, it is not going to kill you, um, and maybe maybe that somehow can be uh, uh, disputed. But um, I think everyone on this call is a uh, testimony that, <clears throat> that we're doing all right. Uh, and, and a lot of us weren't doing all right with the stuff that the medical uh, community was able to give us uh, because of the laws that, were, uh, that are in place. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, this legislation is just a Band-Aid and it's just prolonging um, the, um, the, the right to, to, to sound medical um, access or medical, medical treatment that, that every human being deserves. Um, I, I don't, I, I guess it's more of me being frustrated and being just not, as much as I read, as much, as the, the deeper and deeper we and I go into this, the less and less I understand how this is possible. Um, and yes, I, I am bringing up something that is, a, it's a systematic error, something that, that, that is an extremely hard thing to change um, uh, in the grand scheme of things because it's been in place for so long. But with a, a, an emergency, which yes, this is this. Uh, I, I don't. We can constitute this as emergency. I mean, if if we were able to give cannabis instead of uh, before opiates, um, there'd be there'd be so many. I mean, uh, I'm I'm going to presume presume that there there would be so many less deaths due to opiate overdoses if doctors were able to prescribe cannabis first, Along, not just opiates, but um, sleeping meds and, and benzodiazepine. Um, the point I'm really trying to make is that it, it's, it's something that is so, it, 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 the only thing that's holding us back from the, this access or our doctors being able to access it is, special interests, things that, that don't even, that, that aren't in the focus of the best, uh, the, the best um, interests of the patient. And that's the only way I, I can see it. I think that's, I don't know if anybody could argue with that. And, and what, we've, we've been doing this for, for so long and it's so frustrating that that the people that we elect that are supposed to care for us and supposed to lead by example and 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 do the right thing and and have our best interests in, or have, have the population's best interest in, in mind and we're getting to this point of globalization that we've we've already surpassed and we're we're just dealing with the same issues over and over and over again, election after election. And 
it's it's uh it's disheartening and uh i think i think we really need to um to rethink the way that that we go about this stuff and and figure out a better way to do it because this system is broken if somebody has to go in for example the, the veteran that that wasn't allowed to use cannabis that, that it is um helping her um the court won't let her use that but they'll let her use dangerous addictive narcotics that that potentially and personally have gotten me addicted to heroin you know it, it, it's it's terribly terribly sad and it, we're shooting ourselves in the in our own foot by allowing this to continue happening and yeah it might not be something that is uh, as imminent as a threat and as crammed down our throats and our ears like like uh, COVID has been, but it's killed because of not being able to access cannabis because of the uh, legalities of it has ruined so many families, so many has, has, is responsible for so many deaths. And it, it is just appalling that we are still sitting here begging for our lives in, mo in most cases. Um, to be able to use something that that we all know is far less hazardous than what we are getting. Um, I'm just I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Well, you make some good points, but at the same time, that's why we stay plugged in because we are aware that um, you know change is frustrating. Yes, and I hear your frustrations, and every single one of us that has worked at the federal level, our local level or state level feel you 100% that the system is broke, but that's because we don't have enough people plugging in and actually doing something about it. We have enough people sitting around being, you know, you know, armchair activists as opposed to actually plugging in and doing something. And I commend you and all the other veterans here because we are trying to do things. We are trying to affect change. We are all frustrated. Like I hear you 110%. Um, but if we don't fix it, who will else? That's why we're plugging in. And we have a couple of follow-ups. We're going to go with Michael Crowitz and Rico before we move on to Council Member Buckley. Thanks. Thanks, man. Um, I, I wanted to go back to what Ricardo was talking about with treatment by geography and the uh, unfair you know, nature of the state uh, that you know has good medical access to being right next to a state that doesn't especially now where you aren't able to cross that state line legally unless there's reciprocity and you can have uh you know some sort of uh relationship with that state that way which is only a handful i think there was five or six states that had uh, reciprocity and i think one of them dropped it after a while um so there's very little reciprocity on the medical cannabis programs but that's what uh, what george touched on a little bit got into that uh, federal ID card, essentially. And you know, once we change the law at the federal level, we remove the basically the barriers between the states. And, and I agree that we should have some sort of special protection, some sort of special language written into the law. Um, I don't know how they you know, would want to implement it, but certainly uh, making it very clear that that federal law is intended to protect those who would use cannabis that they got from a state that had a program and use it in their home or in their place uh, uh, that they live in a state that does not have a, a, a medical or a cannabis program. And that would be perfectly legal under federal law. Um, you wouldn't be able to have commerce in it if, if they didn't, I suppose, would be kind of the line. Uh, but you, that, that I believe we'd be able to do under federalism, under the uh, supremacy of the federal law. Uh, we should be able to create that space. And again, it's not perfect because you'd have to leave your state and go to a neighboring state, but with the vast majority again, and, and I think in, in increasing, um, I can't imagine it going the other way. Um, the the uh, access should improve that we have. And, and 
at least it gives us that avenue of being able to use it and, and bring it back to your home. And then uh, the voucher idea, I think, is a very good one. We had come up with basically, I, if I remember correctly, kind of having a voucher similar to a clothing allowance where the veteran would be able to have, uh, based on their need and, and the you know, standard criteria for treatment at the VA, a uh, voucher that they would then be able to take to uh, you know, their uh, uh, you know, the regular reimbursement, just like they were getting uh, reimbursement for travel or clothing allowance or anything else. Um, and uh, I think that that's uh, you know, a reasonable way to handle it again in the interim um, you know, while we're doing this. But uh, that's the way I would look at it. It would be almost like 50 state reciprocity. You know, you'd, you'd have full reciprocity, um, but uh, not necessarily full access. And then the other thing I, I wanted to comment on what Tony was talking about, it's a really interesting idea that I haven't really thought much about or talked much about the idea of reparations. But um, uh, veterans have been disproportionately, disproportionately adversely affected by the war on drugs serious easy case to be made that that as a you know as a, a group or as a, a, a what is a special class what was it under the law that robert found for us uh, I, I i really feel like there is something to talk about there equity uh it, basically what you'd be talking about would be money that would be spent to help uh get veterans that are homeless off off you know off the street and into a house of their own um or uh monies that could be used for um you know sort of uh repairing the damage done kind of stuff at the community level and i as far as the individual uh stuff it, the way the veterans affairs rules are set up it's not that harsh I mean, in my opinion, if you were to go to prison for some heinous crime, they take away your uh, financial benefits, but only while you're in prison. I, I don't believe even under that circumstance, once you're out of prison, that you would have much of a problem getting your uh, benefits restored. And in, while you're in prison, there's provisions that can be made, applications can be made for family members to, to actually access some of that money, even though you're barred from it. So. Uh, um, given that circumstance, I'm not sure that there would be much that we would ask the VA for. I'd be open to talk more about that. I appreciate the group mind on that. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Prieta. Well, just on the on the subject of treatment by geography, thank you for mentioning that and everything else that you, you touched on real quick. Um, welcome home is thrown out there a lot. When troops get back, welcome home, welcome home. We have troops who aren't able to come home yet. You know, they come home and before all these laws started to change, one right after another, they had to make a decision on whether or not they were gonna to try to do the regular nine to five that's required or expected of them while going through all the, um, the legal drugs that people use to get by day-to-day -day, coffee, Xanax, nicotine, soda pop, whatever the fuck your vice is, right? Um, but when they find cannabis and, and something that works for them, they have to make that decision to become an outlaw uh, in order to heal themselves and to be there for them, their families and in order to, to be productive once they return. Um, if their state is uh, super into prohibition, a dry state, as it's referred to, they have to move or risk incarceration and, and everything that, that that comes with. And so when we're talking about people that are supposed to be honored amongst our community because of the sacrifices we've made to protect the freedoms of our our counterpart citizens who are supposed to be back here doing the domestic piece of what it is that we went and did on foreign soil, which is protect our liberty, protect our freedoms, protect the constitution, defend it, right? Uphold it and to, to make sure that the laws that we're crafting are just, equitable, right? And, and dispersed in a manner 
that is equal. And, and we don't have that. We absolutely don't have that. So welcome home is empty rhetoric until we get legislation like access to cannabis and other things uh, that allow us to come home and be present and be a part of the change then that, that we want to see. We went out there, we, we did all whatever we did, we're coming back here now and we don't recognize this place, at least I don't. I don't recognize what it is that I'm supposed to have fought for. And I don't recognize what I see on a regular basis coming from the media with respect to our, our politics. The way that it's being conducted, the way that uh, we're being used as pawns and the constitution is just thrown out when it's convenient, but nobody really seems to understand what it means. Or, or why it it means something to defend it and protect it. And when we're talking about research, we can do research. There's nothing stopping us from doing research except the government. We have the universities who are more than capable to conduct the research to look into this matter. We have dispensaries in many legal states over half of the country there could be some type of partnership, some type of arrangement between the Department of Agriculture, these local businesses uh, who are growing the product, who are producing the product. The government can go through and get a list of what is being sold, do a, do a, a poll to find out what is being taken, right? As it relates to veterans, uh, this is a, a survey that can be conducted through the VA. If they want us to do our job, their jobs for them, we're more than happy to. If they let us come in and provide our opinion and suggestions and then go with it, it doesn't have to be entirely what we suggest, but don't tell us you want us to be a part of the process. And then when we start bringing up things that are uncomfortable or politically inconvenient for you, right, the elected official, then it, it, it just becomes one of those ghosting situations where you thought that you were uh, a part of something and then you have to reevaluate everything. So that that's kind of just my generalized feedback on what it was that I was thinking about listening to the other council members here discuss this. Um, I'll give the mic up, thank you. Okay, carrying on, council member Buckley. Three things you think would unite all Americans would be veterans, kids, and puppies and you know you look at kind of the way we are on like a national level right now where you got one side of the aisle probably thinks their greatest existential threat is the other group on the other side of the aisle and vice versa thank you to our national media aka a a, 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 a snake pit if you will and i think it's kind of moving their priorities where they're looking at different things where it just baffles me where you think you would flip every rock possible to help out men and women who raised their right hand, signed the blank check table with their uh, lives and went forward to fight for the American dream that they so much enjoy. So uh, I hear what everyone's saying here and I think you guys have knocked it out of park on uh, you know definitely the medicinal side and how we can best support veterans. You know, I'm gonna look at things a little bit different that will tie back into that but, you know, myself and Council Mayor Fontan being business owners in cannabis and the restrictions and the games that we have to play, you would hope that some of these things are kind of uh, low hanging fruit that we could cor uh, quickly correct. However, you always have to follow the money. I mean, we saw what happened, I think it was a month or two ago in terms of the IRS leaks where it shows how much they enjoy auditing cannabis companies that are legal and the amount of money they make per hour. And you think about what we have to face with tax code 280E. So some of you watching us at home, if you're not aware of what 280E is, imagine if you had one business, but yet you had to have four separate businesses inside that business in order to make sure you didn't just give the federal government 12% gross right off the top. And with that, you know, being in California, you have to pay $800 a year per EIN or each business you own. So it starts to add up. And then you're looking at the high tax rates. Why am I bringing this up? Well, just imagine if they would just say, looking at where uh, cannabis is uh, on the schedule list right now, so schedule one narcotic. 
even the UN, thank you, Councilmember Krawitz, <laughs> greatly reduced where they put cannabis on, on the schedule list for the UN. Why the United States? And listen, I'm all for we should just deschedule the damn thing. But let's just say at the minimum, if you move this thing to a Schedule 3 status, you have killed Tax Code 280E. And now we could just be a regular business. And what happens is with these high tax rates and all these barriers of entry that we have to jump through, this impacts the end consumer, the patient. They're the ones who are stuck with these tax burdens, everything we have to go to. And you've got to look at people who, why would you want to leave the illicit market if you have to go through all these high barrier of entries to just be legal and pay these high tax rates? If you're a consumer, look at the state of California. I mean, we're upwards towards 30% tax at some areas that is going to go down to the end consumer and they have to pay that. I went into a store where we sell our products, probably the cheapest down here in San Diego in this one shop. I bought one and a half grams. It was 115 bucks all said and done. That is ridiculous. All right. And I, you know, me, a gram will probably last me two weeks, but I know there's veterans out there. They might go through two or three grams a day. And that's just the reality of it. So if you kind of look at things like that, that's some, to me, some low hanging fruit that they could just come together as legislators, say, listen, these are legal companies doing the right thing. Why are we punishing them so much for doing that? And don't look in the mirror and say, my goodness, why do all these illicit markets keep popping up everywhere? I have no idea why. It's ridiculous. So those are things I think they could really knock out real quick on top of a banking act. I mean, we know they've been doing beta tests, especially up in the Fed up in San Francisco. I don't know, ATN, if you've seen anything, I haven't seen any feedback on that thing, but why are we not doing this? Where you even have banks who say, we want your money, we just don't have FDIC approval and we can't take it. So there's things like that that I think they could knock out here in about a six month period and get things moving on that side. We know research is research and that will take time and we understand that, I get that. But these little things that they can do on a legislative side, why are we not doing that? That's all I got. All right, uh, going council member Sean Kernan, your thoughts. Uh, uh, so much to think about. I think you all are entirely too positive. Um, the, uh, you know, it, it's interesting because I think that one of the issues just, you know, state and, and, and federal is are we asking too much of a government that hasn't shown the ability to give a shit about uh, the bottom 90% of their, their country for a long time. And so I think if we're being honest with myself, if we, if we want to affect and impact veterans in the most impactful, efficient and quickest way, we've got to embrace a, a, a movement that puts pressure on the states to, as I think Brian so accurately talks about, is to make industries life easier. Uh, because through making industries life easier and creating a competitive uh, market where we get rid of this oligopoly uh, nonsense, that's the only way you're going to drive prices down to make things accessible. Uh, on the VA side, I'm all for it. And I think it's, it, it's definitely a slog we need to do. And people on this call are doing a wonderful thing. I just don't see much success anytime soon. And so why we legalize state after state, we're going to be fighting the VA when I think a much more efficient fight is to focus uh, on the states. But the problem with that at the end of the day, like federal money matters, organiza organizing matters. And I think we all know the veteran population, especially in cannabis, can be all over the board and fractured in, in many ways. Uh, but I think, you know, one thing we don't have on the enlisted side is the money needed to be heard on government. But what we do have is the numbers, if we can get people uh, to, to organize. And I think that's what we need to do, what I wanna see. And I think is really the only effective way of helping veterans anytime soon is, is to, we have to put pressure uh, on votes and we have to put pressure on the PR side, not let them hug us. Cause that's all they really want is to glad hand the issue and glad hand us. Cause it's just not a priority. I mean. I think, Rick Carter, are we still waiting for the University of Arizona to come out with their PTSD study in cannabis that we were told they were going to come out with in 2013? Uh, you know, the point being is, or 14, the point being is, is, is I just have lost faith, like many of the people on this call. And I don't think it's going to change until we organize, to be very blunt. And I think 
if you see what I'd like to see on the national level or even on the state level, it's speaking with a more unified voice. And, and that's what I think it's going to take to, to get what we want on the legislative side. Uh, right now, uh, we are nothing but straw men and women who, who people want to act like they're helping. And so we see a lot of these bills that aren't really doing much, and yet they say they're doing stuff for us. And so I think at the end of the day, I think until we organize and deal with the real issue we're dealing with, and that's representation or lack of, and how do we get that? uh in cannabis uh that that's something that we're gonna have to organize because our vsos are not doing it for us and i don't believe at the end of the day the legislators uh have the gumption to pass anything worthwhile anytime soon and i agree i don't disagree with you you know we didn't lose all our rights at once and we're not going to gain them all back at once however i uh i'm like you, I see a lot of optimism, but I see a lot of failure coming down the pike um, because of not having uh, bipartisanship, real bipartisanship seems to have died. And by not having people willing to reach across the aisles, even though we have support on both sides of the aisle, we are the straw man. So, you know, it's just unfortunately uh, how I see things, but uh, I, I, I don't disagree with things. However, I'm going to read you all some suggested uh, amendments that we have um, drafted that we've submitted, uh, which is basically recognize veterans as federal patients under the Federal Health Administration, uh, provide for a voucher system for about 10 grams, cannabis average at a cost of each state, of course, would have to process that. Uh, per day for veterans enrolled in the VHA, which they can use to gain access to cannabis flower tinctures, edibles, vapes, or any other available modality from state regulated cannabis programs, including any and all costs associated with certifying veterans for state run cannabis programs. Uh, provide an identifier on all of our VHA identifiers, or our identifying card per se that we carry with us that identifies us as a federal cannabis patient. These cards would provide immunity from prosecution in any U.S. state or territory without functional cannabis programs or while traveling across the country. Also provide the VHA applications to grow cannabis partnership with the Department of Agriculture and universities, as well as any appropriate regulatory agencies. Also provide for authorization of cannabis veteran service organizations, which Sean was speaking toward. Much like the veterans, foreign veterans of foreign wars, the American Legion, or disabled American veterans, so that they could uh, have access for us cannabis patients, so that we could come in and use, or even take it further. Why couldn't they actually apply for dispensaries, just like they have alcohol permits in uh, every single, uh, I mean, American Legion of VFW that I'm aware of that I've ever walked into? There's always a bar but there has never been a cannabis bar. So that's something I would definitely love to see. Uh, we have a follow-up uh, from uh, Pearson on the uh, Princeton oligarchy study. Yeah, um, so, uh, well, the, uh, so the reason I bring the Princeton, uh, the Princeton study up is, is because uh, it, it, it over, I believe uh, 1985 to, nine, uh, to 2002, Princeton went through um, American Americans uh, th their their viewpoints on what legislation should be and what what, what how they feel they uh, how they want um, legislators to vote, and what they found was that. The ninety percent, uh, the 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 bottom ninety percent of, of Americans had little to no effect on the outcome of their legislators' vote. Um, it was only when um, the, the 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 minority that could uh, uh, put uh, donate the Maximum maximum amount of uh, of funds to their uh, campaigns for re-election uh, did it affect their uh, choice in 
in, in the building. Um, that's why I brought brought that up. Um, and it, it's it's something that, that really is um, so it, it's noteworthy that that they're not actually, you know, it, it's it, this career politician um, system that we have. It, it doesn't bring any any competition, any reason for them to actually do what the majority of Americans want them to do, um, which I think everyone has this understanding that, that that's how it works, um, or most people do. Um, now, uh, in 2000, 2020, Alaska voted for uh, changes in the voting system, uh, along with Maine. Uh, Maine and Alaska are the only ones that have uh, voted and uh, passed a ranked choice voting system where um, a, a, a citizen is able to write in their, their, their first choice of candidate, second, third, fourth, and fifth, right? Um, and, and this is, I'm just, uh, no, you can quote me on this. How about that? Um, it, it's where the elect the election goes off of the um, the person that that has the most support by the by the individuals. Uh, it gets away from the the two party system where um, I, I I like to say uh, you know I. It, it, it's 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 a, a quote I heard once, and this isn't verbatim, but verbatim. But uh, okay, I'm going to let everyone have their own vote. Everybody gets an equal vote, right? Every single citizen, but I get to pick who you vote for. And the person, the, the people that that win um, the uh, the chance to be voted on, the two. Uh, the Democratic or Republican nomination is the one who comes up with the most money. Um, we've seen, I think, uh, uh, individuals that are running for presidency that have, that have uh, uh, raised $20 million in one, one night. And, um, and it really, like, what how does that happen? You know, what do you have to promise someone that you're going to do for $20 million? Uh, you know, um, no, I'm not saying I, there's no, there, there's no, I'm not indicating that there was any wrong uh, or mal uh, reasoning for that. But uh, at the end of the day, it, it's something that, that we, Need to need to look into a little bit more, and and if we are only having to um, choose from two people or two individuals out of the three hundred eighty three million that we have in America, um, just look at the past couple elections where, I mean. Okay, Pearson, we're trying to keep this on cannabis. There's nothing we can do about the elections, et cetera. You know, yeah, I, okay, okay, I, I understand sorry. your point, but if you could just wrap it up, you're just going off on a tangent, which is nothing to do with what we're talking about. Roger that. What, I, what I'm saying is, is the, 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 the issue is bigger than, than what, what we're concentrating on right now in order to to fix it, we need to we need to try to fix the system, and it's you know. Uh, I apologize for for the tangent, but it like I said, it's uh, it's severely frustrating, and a lot of uh, a lot of good people are putting a lot of effort into something that is on this is completely necessary, but unfortunate. I understand and respect that, but the system has to change. We're just talking about the change that we can affect within the system that we have currently. Trust me, I want a different system altogether. And actually, we have ranked choice here in California as well, by the way. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I know. Uh, been doing it for a couple of elections now. Um, but uh, which I agree with. I, I, I think it's, it's better and gets better understanding of the electorate and what the, the people have. 
but we are the people as well and we can plug in and we need to plug in. So uh, where we are is um, what we've been talking about. Um, now we'll talk about what we feel is likely to go through. I'll go back to where I was kind of pessimist wise. I want to see this legislation. I will lobby for and talk to people regarding this legislation, but I'm not gonna deny that uh, I am pretty, um, you know, um, in the effect that I don't see much change happening because I've been around this for 30 years and I've seen a lot of talk about change, uh, but no real change actually happened. We are getting close. I can feel we're at a precipice, but, you know, um, I can't say I have uh, the, the best faith as well in our system. However, I can affect change within our system, which is why we've come together, which is why we put these thoughts together and we're suggesting and reaching out to, you know, different representatives and senators and legislators so that they have an understanding about how we feel that we are past being made to feel like we are uh, an actual straw, you know, argument that we are an actual real and that it has to be dealt with. Eventually we're going to get past that, but you know, uh, that's how I feel, but that's not how everybody else feels. So we're going to go around and talk it. Rico, how do you feel? I feel great. I just took a fat ass dab. So uh, thank you again for your legacy stash, Mr. ATN. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Anyway, um, <laughs> what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, politics. Got it, got it. So um, it's there's a lot happening and we're those of us especially who have been in this thing for years others on this call decades we're used to failure <laughs> it's just like we get a lot of it we just like we're shocked when things actually go correct so for us to maintain the status quo as far as we'll believe it when we see it i think is a healthy respect for the situation that we have in front of us and that we've been facing and so like it's all well and good while it's being discussed, debated and whatever, but until it hits the paper and gets sent up to, you know, El Comandante in the White House uh, to sign, then uh, it's all just bullshit. So until that happens, right, we're, we're in the same spot that we've been in. It's just with different language and a different kind of, uh, chaos going on that we're still trying to identify, figure out and explain to ourselves uh, and disseminate to the outside world who's just as shocked as we are to be quite frank, uh, at least I am. Um, but I do see something that when I was getting into this movement in 13 and stuff like coming out of my closet, the the advances being made and the pushes being made on various pieces of legislation is something that I have not seen. And reading in the history through the trials and tribulations of Mr. and Mrs. Randall, uh, Robert and Alice, uh, there are a lot of parallels, but then it branches off and takes this vertical uh, at some point, and we're still trying to scroll up to see what's going on, to see when it starts to make a level plane again. But um, it's anybody's fucking guess. We'll see. I know that we should probably try to emulate Canada though and bring down some of that maple syrup. I want to. I want to visit our, our our buddy Mr. Victory up there and see what they got. I'll pass the mic. Yeah, because uh, uh, we would love to have what Canada has for access to their cannabis for their veterans where they can actually pull up on their phone and actually order their cannabis and it's delivered to their house via the mail in two days. Come on people. What's not to love about that? You know, you don't even have to go to the store. Not only that, you can pick how you want it. If you want it in vaporizer form, edible form, smokable form, however you want it, you know, they have access to it. So it's all good, you know, but uh, we need that down here for sure. We have to definitely take a trip up north. Uh, Council Member Landry. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to just a, a day 
where, you know, the drug war is, is looked at differently. It's not looked at like uh, we're criminals to use cannabis. You know, it's, it's, it's still going to take a while to get, you know, these uh, police forces in these states that are prohibition minded states, you know, to, to, um, to release the grip of that war. I mean, that's a powerful thing for them to, to keep, you know, keep the oppression on cannabis, but it, it's done with, you know, they, they can give it up now or they can give it up later, but it's going to, the laws will be changed. Cannabis is going to be just like alcohol. And, but we still need to fight for the medical part of it because there is medicinal qualities to the plant and, and, and it's helping veterans. And, um, you know, we're going to get the access to the VA. There's no, no two ways about it. Come now or later, but it's going to come. So I'm happy to be in the fight for it. A lot of people, a lot of these veterans, they can't do what we're doing. They're, they're uh, bedridden or they're um, financially distraught and they can't even afford a computer to do this stuff we're doing right now. So um, I'm just happy to be doing this for them, for those that can't be here. And thank you. And we appreciate you holding up your spotlight as long as you can. So hold up your torch so that others can see and rally around you. Council Member Armstrong. So, yeah, I'll be short because apparently my internet connection's not very good, not very stable here tonight. Um, but I would I would start by saying, going back a little bit, something I didn't mention of, of something I'd really like to see. I really think that um, Patients being able to grow their own medicine is something we're really fighting for here in Pennsylvania. And I think uh, I just like to put that in. I think that's something that um, is an answer for the uh, a lot of the problems of access, especially the, the monetary problems, the problems of uh, that people can't afford it. Um, and I will stick to my being short. And I would say that in the next two years, if I'm given an honest assessment with the Congress we have here, I probably would say none of these bills will get signed into law. Um, but I think some federal action, like everybody said, is coming. Um, I think if I had if I had to predict, I would say that it'll be it'll, you know, 1996 were the was the first two medical programs. Um, passed, and I think that'll be like 28 years later for the 2024 presidential campaign. I think maybe it'll finally take a forefront, be a forefront issue in that campaign, and that would get us uh, full legalization in 2025. That's my pessimistic uh, view, and as far as uh, when I think the fight is done, I don't think the fight is done until every person in the country has the opportunity to use the medicine in any way they want and grow it themselves. So that's where I'll finish tonight. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Crowett, sorry, I, uh, I, we kind of skipped around a little bit, but I know you wanted to uh, say a couple of words about uh, the treaty change. Not a problem at all. Man. Um, first, I, I wanted to agree with uh sean a uh, lot more than he probably would think i would <laughs> uh, i agree with him a lot and uh especially about bolstering the the local businesses um you know i'm going under the proviso or the understanding that you know we're going to get something federally pushed on the president's desk and he's going to sign it within or she's going to sign it within this administration meaning you know it, it, the pro four-year potentially eight-year term um or, or even longer, it could work out where you want with a four year term and then uh, Vice President Kamal Harris wants up uh, running for office. So anyway, a lot of different permutations and thoughts. And the, one of the funny things is that we've got this battle where we got a lot of Republicans, uh, uh, you know, and a lot of Democrats. So we have, you know, just the tiniest little tiny majority of Democrats, if we had a really, really overwhelmingly big majority of Democrats, and especially if that happened with a lot of the forces uh, coming from certain quarters, you know, of our world, uh, and, and created sort of the scenario where you had like the California AUMA at the national level, I could probably pretty easily say that would be like Sean's nightmare scenario, you know, um, and uh, yet that would be, you know, 
in a lot of ways what we're aiming for and that would be the closest direct route to like what we would have in canada however that isn't likely what we're going to get because we need republican support i've been looking at this model that i was talking about where it's likely that we would legalize the federal level but lean on the states allow the states to continue the programs that they have the sort of a state rights uh uh, uh protection sort of route and uh going on that you know sort of assumption I've been working, but you know, the more I think about this, the, the less I think that states are gonna be able to opt out. You can't just opt out. What do you think, Sean? If you pass federal law that allows for states to have legal access, you take cannabis out of the schedules and you federally legalize it where you have uh, you know, federal oversight over you know, the, the states doing their own thing, you know, in other words, the states can cross state line and not fear any kind of repercussion from the federal government. You'd have state to state commerce. Would a state be able to, you know, they could they even on two questions? One, could they opt out, especially like medical? Like, could they just say, oh, you know, because you can't just stop medical patients from having medicine. And then the other thing, could they opt out in, a, in any kind of feasible way? Because you're going to have legal cannabis going through your state because it's legal under federal law and you can't stop it. <laughs> I don't know. It's like living in a leaky bucket and and, uh, and trying it. But anyway, before you, you answer, if you want to hold your thought for a second, Sean, the one minute thing about the treaty, I finally just the other day got a copy of the letter that was sent to the, each country that told them about the change in the treaty. The treaty under underpins our federal law and is in fact written in our Controlled Substances Act that when there's a, a significant change in the treaty, that our attorney general will have to make a determination of what kind of schedule we would need for that to uh, accommodate that change in treaty. And we've been arguing all along, three, four, or five, two won't do. Absolutely, absolutely true. And I didn't mean to even rhyme that, but that worked out pretty good. But anyway, yeah, um, that's where we're at. And uh, hopefully, you know, very, very soon, we'll see some action out of the federal government on that. But uh, I'm hoping that we can gently cajole uh, the president, President Biden to go to three, four or five as a result of that treaty change instead of just rescheduling to two. And that would I think that would take the heat off a lot of conversations. And again, you could throw that back at me, too, Sean, if you got any uh, thoughts on that. You want me to talk now or is uh, sure, go, ahead. go ahead, Sean. No, Mike, I mean, I, I, I think I agree with you, but then it gets to functional model, right? And I think that the key thing about all this, what's going on is we're seeing the decriminalization of cannabis, right? In, in states like California, where you've seen now decriminalized in, in a way that you're charged with possession, but you restrict supply, there is no, do you have access? It's do you have access through the licensed market or do you have access in the illicit market? So I think what's likely to very much happen is the illicit market's going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger throughout the country. Uh, and not that it's not strong already, but in terms of just the disruption from the legal industry being rolled out, <laughs> then you're going to have cost prohibition is what we have. And that is just, as we said, people can't afford it. So they either have to choose not to use cannabis or they buy cannabis in the illicit market. So I, I think really what it comes down to is we're going to see cannabis mirror what is going on with America, which is you have multiple Americas and you have an America that cannabis policy works for. Uh, you have an America where cannabis policy has advanced. Uh, but for patients, medical patients, that America, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse because ironically, in places like California with 45 million people, now we're more likely to, to ingest meds rejected because of, of, of you know, chemicals being used in the legal market, uh, it's being moved on to the illicit market. So um, to your point, I sure hope it's three. That would be a positive. I think, you know, I agree with you. If Biden's in for eight years, you're likely to see something done. I'm hoping you get some stuff done here in his first four. I'm just not confident. And I think part of the issue is until we recognize that a lot of what's going on is tax academy, people look for platforms to fight and it's that political, you know, who am I fighting for? What am I fighting for? What am I advocating for? It's a way of organizing. And so I even think the Democratic Party and the Republican Party to a certain extent, um, you're dealing with voters who are state 
working within their party and not switching because of it. And at the end of the day, you, you know, the, the political parties are motivated to keep it going. Um, because, you know, if, if, and both sides will argue they're pushing cannabis. And that's why I think so much of what's going on is lip service. It's what's called the, my, my, uh, friends who, who do lobbying, taxi cabbing. And so I think to your extent, I hope we get what you're saying done. Um, but you know, the problem with the current administration and Congress is I don't think you have 50 democratic senators who really want to. Uh, legalize cannabis or or change its policy because there are some tied up in who are getting lots of money from the uh from the uh pharmaceutical industry and the judicial system and all it takes is one democratic senator or two um to basically shut this thing down and so i'm not positive at least until the next election and that's assuming that democrats get more votes uh you know more uh seat or representation that they're going to do much here Yeah, I don't disagree with that either. Um, Council Member Buckley. So I'll go a little bit optimistic here. Um, all right, so you got, I think it was Rahm Emanuel phrase this term, always take advantage of a crisis. So you kind of look at, you know, let's look at a state level. So New York, they wanted to go to adult use for a long time. And Governor Cuomo was like, no, no, no. And then Governor Cuomo allegedly might have did some things he probably was not supposed to do. And then next thing you know, adult use went to New York. You can look at Virginia. You have a governor that was in a yearbook. Either or whatever picture he was was not good, right? Next thing you know, cannabis legislation tended to speed up a little bit. We were just having an opportunity to talk with a uh, senator's office this week, and we were looking at, you know, Business Insider, and it said in this state, 86% of the people polled are for the VA to give medical cannabis to veterans. You know, I said this the other day, it's like in America this day and age, you can't get 86% of the population to agree that Monday falls on Monday. So there is a lot of overwhelming support for it. And that is pretty much nationwide. We luckily had things called midterms. I know politicians probably go into uh, their office with the right mind, but I think they'd really like to keep their jobs too. So you never know what might happen with all this momentum coming up. Who knows where we're gonna be in another year or two where they're coming up for reelection, their people are speaking and jumping up mad it might force their hands to actually represent the people they're supposed to represent. So that's where I kind of keep an optimistic look of the, let's just keep flooding the zone with positivities and what we're doing and how this is working. And eventually they can't deny it. I mean, I'm sure, you know, guys who've been in this for a lo lot longer than I have, you've seen a lot of change from where you began to where it is now. And it seems like the snowball's picking up more mo momentum. And eventually, you know, you'll, you'll have a White House where they are what they are. They said what they said. You can look at some of their past and some of that wasn't too great. And they kind of tend to flip flop, but I think they'll go with it. So to me, that's what kind of drives me is the same positive and being optimistic about this, you know, control what you can control and just keep driving and pushing the thing forward and we'll see what happens. But I just think it's just getting to that point. It's getting so normalized from where it was, you know, five years ago that I just think it's going to be they cannot deny it and they got to represent the people and, and fulfill their needs and what they want to do. So that's my optimistic take on this one for you. And that's a very optimistic way <clears throat> and a great way to end the conversation for the night. Um, because you're all right. You know, we're all in this because we want to see effect change. Yes, we talk negative because we're in the system. We understand what the system is. And uh, there's a lot of problems with the system, which uh, Council Member Crosby spoke toward uh, quite in depth and passionately about. And it's a lot of change has to happen. And there's a lot of things out there. Ours are veterans and cannabis and other natural <clears throat> medicines. So this is where we are and this is our strength. So if you're watching it and you have other issues, plug in, I mean, get active. I mean, and if you support us in these issues, don't forget to call your congressman, senator, et cetera, when these bills come up or figure out a way to get plug in. You know, there's local organization, there's statewide organizations, there's nationwide organizations. 
they're all out there. They can represent you. But on top of that, if you're not very educated or not sure where to go, they can educate you and provide you with materials and information. So, you know, as well as <clears throat> thankfully, we've got this thing called the Internet and there's lots of search and information. And we presented a lot of ideas and a lot of this is searchable. All of these bills that we talked about are searchable. They're all there for you. So if you see the change and you don't like it, then you can also contact your senator, representative, legislator and do something about it. Each one of us here is actively doing something about it to try to affect the change that we want to see. And it requires, you know, each one of us doing what we need to do to see that change. So, you know, uh, I'm thankful for each one of your voices. I'm thankful for each one of you for what you're doing and plugging in. Uh, it is a challenge and it will constantly stay a challenge, but this is uh, one that uh, ap appeals to me and I feel like can hopefully affect some change with my brothers and sisters here. So I uh, thank you all for joining us in this discussion. And if anything, I should uh, remind you to stay plugged in, stay active, stay involved. If not, plug in so that you are so you can have a better understanding of what's going. So you can join us in these conversations, uh, actively lobbying for change. So uh, here in the future, we wanna schedule an actual lobby day in DC. So we're going to be working on that as well so that we're gonna take a bunch of veterans up on the hill that are <coughs> cannabis related and try to affect our change direct. So, you know, stay tuned for that. That's coming up in, in, the, in the next year, so. A lot of things happening. A lot of things continue to happen. So we'll be back in two weeks with a uh, VAC roundtable number 18. And I appreciate all of our veterans tonight. Rico Prieta, Tony Landry, Michael Krawitz, George Armstrong, Brian Buckley, Sean Kernan, and Pearson Kennedy Crosby, who joined us tonight. And uh, y'all have a great rest of your night. And we'll see y'all next time around.